excuse me, I have a question for everybody. Do you know what the word sesquicentennial means? No. Can you say sesquicentennial? Go ahead. Give it a sesquicentennial. 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 You guys say it pretty well. What if I were to tell you it meant 150 years? <gasps> How old are you? Um, six. You're six years old. Do you know that the school next year will be 150 years old? That's why next year will be the sesquicentennial celebration at Brooklyn Friends School. So everybody, one more time, say sesquicentennial. Sesquicentennial. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to the BFS E! News Podcast. I'm Andy Cohen, your host. And that was a little bit about the sesquicentennial that's coming up, and we will be talking a lot more about that as the podcasts go on. But today, we're doing something a little different. Carpe diem. Seize the day and put the least possible trust in tomorrow. Horace. Quintus Horatio Flaccus, known in the English-speaking world as Horace, was the leading Roman lyric poet during the time of Augustus, circa 30 BC or so. I think I got that right, and if not, because of the upcoming National Latin Exam, here in studio we have the combined expertise of the BFS Latin teachers, Katie Koken, Dr. Steve Wartman, and Martin Moore. So, uh, did I get that right on the enunciation of all the names and Almost. things? Almost. Uh-oh. It's uh, Quintus Horatius Flaccus. Oh, very nice. Right. Quintus Horatius. Horatius. Oh, oh boy. Okay, I never took Latin, and it's a it's a shame because I love language, and I like to know roots of languages, and I love history as well, and I think these are all kind of wrapped up into why we teach this dead language. Isn't that true? Latin is a language as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me, I think is the... A most erroneous axiom. Right. A way of looking at it is that it is ancient Italian. And another way of looking at it is that it's the official language for whole areas of the Vatican. Many court cases are conducted exclusively in the Latin language. But Latin is far from dead. It's really uh, an opportunity for students to learn the archaeology of language. You know, the the bones and the skeleton of, of our own language and of, of the other modern uh, Romance languages as well. So we teach Latin 7th grade through 12th grade and do each of these students uh, participate or who participates in the National Latin Exam? Yep, all the Latin students, yeah. middle school and upper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is this, um, is this something they look forward to or, or is this something that you guys look forward to? <laughs> well, I think the youngsters have some trepidation about it. They think it might be, uh, you know, determinative of their grade or something. But we, it's it's completely separate from our uh, curriculum, really. And therefore, uh, there will be areas that uh, students who have studied our uh, our particular curriculum, the Cambridge Latin course. Um, haven't covered. Um, we, we do try to fill in the gaps. We've had very successful results of the National Latin Exam over the years. It's almost miraculous that we have, given the, uh, uh, the class time, which affords us almost no opportunity to really cover Roman culture outside of our National Latin uh, review. So to some extent that review has become part of our our curriculum. We still have a scope and sequence that we try to get through 
because we're always looking ahead to kids moving on to high school and eventually into, you know, into I, IB. After the kids' initial trepidation, we show them that it's something that they can do, that no grades involved, no, the only ones who will know their score will be them and their teacher. And before too long, they accept it as a fun challenge. And they're suddenly showing me that they know much more Greek and Roman mythology and history than I ever expected. And I started giving these exams back in the late 70s to Brooklyn Friends. We have always, fortunately, scored very well, and we continue to do so. And last year, I had the honor of having one of my students get a perfect paper. Dr. Steve has had that happen before, and it's an honor to the school and to the student especially, and maybe to the teacher, for that to happen. Um, the student who does well gets a certificate. Um, there are gradations of reward. There's a cum laude, a magna cum laude, a summa cum laude, and a, a maxima below the summa. Um, and those who score at the highest levels also get a little bling. Bling, you know, yes. They uh. get a, a medal, a gold medal, or a silver medal, or a ribbon in the case of the seventh grade introductory. We sort of judge ourselves on how much you know bling we get at the end of the year, but um, a, is it a heavy package this year? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> uh, really, it is quite remarkable how well Brooklyn Friends students do, um, given the constraints of our of our schedule. You have to really focus on the essentials without a lot of circumlocution. So, touching on what Martin was saying is that it's not all just about language, right? 18 questions are on language. So you'll have some kids who you know, they're a little, they have, they, they, that really intimidates them. Um, and especially since there are going to be a few things that they'll be given a crash course on. But then it also brings out, you'll find someone is, has almost an encyclopedic knowledge of history um, or, of, or of myth. And... So, you know, so that sometimes I think we're surprised by the success of some of the students that we might not have you know, predicted. Yeah, we had a show recently about Shakespeare and when, you know, and asking people, when were you turned on by Shakespeare? And do you have similar experience with Latin? When was that moment that you really thought, oh, wow, this is something special. This is something I really want to teach. I actually took a competitive exam in high school and um, won a scholarship uh, for, for college study um, that came with a stipulation that I study either Latin or Greek for a year, and that was really the impetus that uh, pushed me forward uh, in classics. At the end of my senior year of college, I was offered a fellowship to come back and do graduate school. And at the year of the time that I needed, I, I knew I had to get a job. My Greek professor wrote me a letter of recommendation to a teacher's agency <clears throat> on the East Coast and got me a job in New York, where I had always dreamed of going. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Latin teachers were in demand because it was right after Sputnik. And Americans were upgrading their educational system to keep up with the Russians. And they were not only upgrading science, they were also upgrading languages. And good schools all taught Latin. And uh, it was my obvious choice since I majored in Greek and Latin. My dad was the, uh, he was the consul of his uh, Latin club at Belleville High School in New Jersey. And uh, their Latin club had 250 members. My dad would always have a dictionary in the dining room and would constantly be throwing words at me. And then he would say, now let's see where this word comes from. So I was kind of used to etymologies from when I was really a little guy. And then I had seventh grade 
Latin. And not that I thought, gee, I want to teach this, nor did I have any idea of the language in context, but I just loved the language itself. Um, and that just totally turned me on. It was a combination of things. I think also reading the and r that little Rouse version of the uh, of the Odyssey also in sixth grade just kind of like printed that matrix on me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, just to totally put you guys on the spot, do you have a favorite recitation? Uh, in Latin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we could do the beginning of the of the Aeneid in unison. Well, I give my classes every year, the first year class, I give them the Pater Noster to memorize for the pronunciation. It's a pronunciation drill like no other. Once they learn to say sanctificator, they can say just about anything. And if they go past second year with me, they do learn the first 11 lines of the Aeneid and in perfect dactylic hexameter. And the class of 1975 came back for their 30th anniversary a couple of years ago. And three of the young men who had been in four years Latin with me came over and started reciting Arma Verum Quae Cano Troiae Qui Primus Aboris, which made me feel pretty good. Thank you all so very much. How do I say goodbye in Latin? Wale day. But we to you say wale. Do you wale to us, plural, wale day. Where you're saying goodbye, y'all, and we're saying goodbye, you, Andy, just you. Wale. Yo. You. You say to us, Wale te. Yo. Okay, let's get this right. Wale te. Wale. Wale. Magiste. On today's show, you've been listening to some music from Elvira Sullivan, our orchestra teacher here at Brooklyn Friends School. She recorded that on her iPhone. Pretty good. Thank you so much. And whether it's English or Latin, let's all remember to let your life speak.